We begin with Mr. C.F. Foster, and next will be E.R. Samson. Mr. Foster, thanks for your patience. Go ahead. This is Charles Foster. I came here February 2nd, 1948. And it's been a pleasure to work here. However, in 1952, December 29th, I'm going to make this show and I can't get away. That stuck a wild brush. It was contaminated with the plutonium. I was working out of hood ink on 234 dash files. Uh, that's about all I can say for that. But anyway, they developed what is now known as the uh, body counter. At, at that time, they had no way of reading contamination or anything. It, was under, it, it had a short way, and uh, even the speech paper was covered it was within time. Well, in 1957, this, this old boy got his thing completed. He thought he had it ready. And then he called me in to the air to come out to one of the areas I can get numbers in the jail. And uh, said he had it ready. It consisted of five lead brick with his instrument inside. This brick was to keep the radiation down from anywhere else or to get to actually where the brick cut. And by that time, it began to turn white in our street here in the Fort Shufflet thing. That where a brush was in the hood, eight there, uh, it was left in there to work. They had two dressing engines and this wire brush. I was supposed to take them to flanges and put them up, uh, flange them up on there. It was raised race flanges, and that's how it showed. And by the way, I had on uh, two pair of surgeon gloves, then a pair of canvas gloves, and then a big heavy rubber glove in working that hood. And I couldn't quite reach the pipe, and I turned it with the brush back this way, and the, by the way, the handle had a hook on it. And I got it in there and hooked it up over there. But whenever you rupture the glove, this room is already on. Ordinarily, it was on just to get rid of the air. It wasn't anything wrong with it. But whenever you rupture the glove or anything, you had to report it. And they put the room on the mask. Well, they uh, went to that. Pulled that up over there while I felt a brick in my hand. And I knew I ruptured the glove. And so I told him, I said, I ruptured the glove. Everybody had their shirt street clothes on in there. It was as I cleaned it, so they wore their street clothes in there. But of course, I was dressed every day that. I had coveralls on. And, uh, and they all these bunch of gloves. And uh, so when they, they take them up to this sleeve off here and then this one over here and and uh, monitor and uh, it was uh, you know, I, think, I think they said this would be over a million count. I am not going to show you that but it seemed to me that's what they said. So we feel it let out of garment off and put it in a rope and a proper tanker. Run them down down to the last surgery love and it was hot.
שאלה יש גם ביחד. I want to donate 
myself, or everything is good for people that need it. And the old boy that wanted to shut around, he's over there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Up next is Mr. Sampson. Is that correct? Following Mr. Sam. I'm sorry? If you, are you wanting to sign up to speak? Well, I'd like to thank Art. You said earlier, sign Art, turn it in. Oh, okay. We'll try, we'll try and get to you as soon as we can. Yeah. Okay. Now, after Mr. Samson will be Mr. Don. Aubrey Don. Mr. Samson. I guess everybody here will be catching. <laughs> I, I'm kind of hard here, so I talk a lot. <laughs> I'm in journeyman line and I started working out there in the year 1948. I worked real hard. I worked in the two east, two west, about the only one I hadn't worked in in 100 DR. During that time, I never had a problem one when I went to work UNC. When we got to work down there, we only had about 2,000 hours we could hand in the month and you got laid off sent back to town. Because you're not ours. So I was disturbed about it. I didn't think too much about it. I just went ahead and done the job and forget about it. In the meantime, I was down working right by the big carbon pile where the old Petoni mid inside or whatever you want to call it, you know what I mean? You can call it a lot of things, but anyway, in the meantime, I got a little stuff up my nose in there from changing them vapor type lights that was in there. When they started to come out for lunch, the guy said, wait a minute, you can't go no hurry and put that across my nose there and it just pegged the needle. So they took me in there, they worked about an hour and a half on me and they couldn't get much going and it's still hot as hell in there. Took me into the ATWL, which was behind the Cadillac in there, it was in there three and a half hours before they got it out. The thing I'm disturbed about, they said, that can't cause cancer. Now, I'm the only one in my family who's got cancer. I had part of it taken off my ear. I've got a spot in my nose now. I've got a spot in my neck, and I've got a spot back in my back. Same thing. What I want to know is why would just me and my family get it, cancer, and none of the rest of them have it, or they ain't never worked out here, neither. So the only thing I'm disturbed about is they say, oh, well, that can't cause cancer. This was in 1973 when this happened. I'm a lineman. I work all over the country, and I've worked in every place out there, plus everywhere in the country. And not, the only other thing I got disturbed about is when you go to the state industrial to get on there, if you ain't working, you can't file a claim. So what's good to do file a claim if you ain't working, see? That's what the young lady I talked to down there, he said, said that they're going to try to get an umbrella set up going for us. That would help immensely. Uh, one other thing that I said, told her about is, I did get a little compensation when I pulled all the muscles out from my knee. I got on disability. I'm doing fine. I've drawn about $1,600, $1,700 a month, only a half what I would make otherwise. Next thing they know, I hear they hear I'm drawing Social Security and a little two hundred dollar union pension, so they take that off my disability. So what the hell good does that work? The only reason I went back to work, the union was holler as hell. They said, Ready to come back to work? We need you out here. And then I'm seventy three and I'm still working. I'm going to New Arizona on an inspector job next week. So protect these guys that's out here working now. That's the main thing. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. Mr. Dodd is up, and then we will have Charles Moore.
so I feel comfortable with things like that. Well, in the early 1950s, I went to work at Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory in New Mexico, and in special problems group in the Health and Safety Division, and most of my work was done in environmental surveys, so you and I should have something in common. But much of my work took me to the Nevada bomb test site during the 1950s, and one time my partner and I going out to start the equipment to collect air samples of fallout from a surface bomb test. Our instrument and our vehicle began to go off scale on all of the different settings, so we figured we were in a radiation zone that we hadn't expected yet. We were closer to the bomb test than we thought, so we left and never got our instrument started. Luckily, we were wearing personal dosimeters at the time, an old uh, brass frame holding a piece of dental film. And I recall very clearly that that was red, and I was told I had, and my partner also, about the same thing, 15 rem dose from that one exposure. That was a full year's exposure dose at that time under the old ADC rules. I'm sure you know what an ADC means, same as DOE now. Well, what I really want to talk about is the fact that Los Alamos and the contractor who may be operating the facilities at, in Las Vegas now have no record whatever of that incident Although from Los Alamos, I have a sheet with different years, radiation exposure, a number of years had nothing at all, and the only way I could have got no radiation exposure in those years would have been not working at all. So there's something wrong, and I need help from maybe the Justice Department who really administers this public law that we're talking about. I need help to find out what happened to that. But that's not all. Later, after graduate study at the University of Rochester Radiation Biology Lab, I worked at Idaho Reactor Test Station. And in early 1961, the stationary low-power reactor SL-1 had a major accident, blew out the control rods, killed three military workers on duty. And I went in the next morning early, and the contractor, Phillips Petroleum Company, who had set up the entry point, suited me up in protective clothing, that is, anti-contamination clothing, booties, uh, gloves, and masks and such, and cap, jackets. Well, the radiation monitor who accompanied me into the reactor building his instrument went off scale at the foot of the stairs going up to the reactor head level, but I went on up and he refused to go with me because it was too dangerous, the radiation. When I came out of that, oh, I went in to retrieve a nuclear accident dosimeter, which I had placed there a month or so before as part of my duties as nuclear safety engineer there. And when I got back to uh, changed back to my normal clothes from that entry. They asked for my dosimeter, and I said, what dosimeter? They had not given me a personal dosimeter, so there's no record whatever of my radiation exposure. And I was an employee of the Atomic Energy Commission at that time. And today, their records do not show any radiation incident at that occurs. If they had together my Nevada test exposure and my Idaho exposure together would have caused them to put me out to pasture, if you know that term, in a job where I would have no contact with the radiation again, but that didn't happen, so I came on here to Idaho, uh, to uh, Hanford and worked 10 years or so to finish my career. And once 
while working here at Hanford, also as a nuclear safety engineer and radiological physicist. I almost fainted on a job one day and I was sent to a nearby dispensary and they did a, a glucose tolerance test. Recently when trying to get my medical records of occupational exposure through the uh, now Battelle laboratory there, the uh, contractor who administrated those records, they could not find that, so I have no record here. I'm beginning to wonder if there's really a conspiracy among employers to eliminate some employees from any uh, benefit, whatever. Incidentally, this law passed in 1990, according to the local newspaper. I believe that's what we're talking about, to get compensation for people who have suffered injury on the job. And it's a public law to compensate victims of <coughs> nuclear weapons test programs, and I should qualify for compensation. Incidentally, 10 or 12 years ago, at about age 55, I had to retire because of cataracts of the eyes. Are you familiar with that as a radiation injury, sir? Uh, I don't know, sir, I'm not. Well, maybe this will be informative to you. Early on at University of Rochester Graduate School, I learned that the lens of the eye is a sensitive, radiation sensitive tissue. And years later, the Atomic Energy Commission had within its standards for radiation permissible exposure, what they call a dose based on the critical organ, and the lens of the eye was a critical organ for a certain types of radiation. But very few people know that out in society today, that the lens can receive cataracts from radiation exposure. Let me give an example. Just a few minutes earlier, you said a couple of bad words when you mentioned Centers for Disease Control. Three years ago here in the Tri-Cities, a group of medical doctors came from Atlanta to orient themselves in the Hanford workers' problem. I talked to one doctor aside one evening who, and I told him that I had to retire because of cataracts. I couldn't keep up the reading requirements on the job. Normally, to do that, I had to have, say, a draftsman's table with a bat battery of fluorescent lamps over here to give me enough light. I'd like to read my letter, but I can't read tonight. The light isn't good enough. But that doctor told me that he had never read or heard that cataracts could be caused by radiation. So if the rest of the doctors at the Centers for Disease Control don't know any more than that, then they can't help us in any way. So please tell them to get educated on radiation effects. Here, here. approached the receptionist's desk and signed up. I left uh, a letter explaining all that I talked about tonight for you. But in case it might have gotten shredded, do you remember Ollie Martin? <laughs> all of his records got shredded. And I'll give you another one. And I'd like to talk with you some day or your staff about how this public law to compensate atomic workers is doing up until now, because the fact that I'm still alive, I didn't qualify for any benefits. Incidentally, I think now I might, because within the past year, I've developed a cancer on my cheek. Two different biopsies have established the condition. It's cancerous now, and maybe I should apply again, because I have talked to all our senators Started, oh, by the way, I worked for years at Fernald, Ohio, what was once declared the most contaminated uh, site in the Atomic Energy Commission, now next to Hanford site. So I've been around in chemical exposure as well as radiation, and I, th I worked with 
Beryllium petrosalamos and later a potable reactor test station as well as in the uh, SL1 accident. So thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. With my father, who died of a lung disease, my mother died of cancer. They both work on the project. I started uh, high school working on a project in 1950. And I took a leave of absence for four years for something called the Korean conflict. On return, I went to work at Tea Plant. a big job there, process utility operator, they gave me a broom. I'm not a downwinder. I helped make the wind. <laughs> because that's where it came from, was uh, Tea Plant. I can go into illustration after illustration that happened to me in tea plant, and I'm sure some of you went through the same thing. But after tea plant shut down, they moved me into the U area. I had two young children, one just born at the time. U area was a, they call it a calcining building, but later through my research, they called them the lucky pots. We were taking waste. Instead of putting in the tank farm, we were taking waste, and we didn't know at the time, but it came from uh, Purex, third of two west. And we dried that in open vats. And we stood over those open vats with vacuum cleaners and vacuumed that waste and put it in a trash can in, in metal cans. Three times I was brought into supervision, and they told me that I wasn't taking enough radiation. At the particular time, radiation monitors would not enter the building. It was that high in radiation. We used a salt mass. And through my research, we found that radon gas was high in those buildings, and an old, dirty, worn out salt mass will not stop, even a new one will not stop radon gas. They furnished their own shoes. And I don't remember how long I was there because. It was one of the most horrible times I ever had in my life. And from there, I transferred to a Two West shop and worked as a sheet metal man. As a sheet metal man, I worked out there for five years and I was still a premise. I couldn't get a promotion. And I just found out why, because some idiot wrote a letter saying I was a whistleblower, I was a no good character, don't promote him or don't do anything for him. And I found that out through my Freedom of Information Act. So if you want to talk about the Hanford Project, I'm bitter. And after working there, then I went to work for Jamie Jones on the same project, doing the same thing as a journalist. And after 22 years on the project, they fired me for lack of production. I couldn't work. I had bad lungs. I had bad lungs today. I was in... Uh, Seattle Friday to a specialist. I've gone to about three or four of them. And nobody can tell me what's wrong with my lungs. The University of Washington, their first report was uh, he has pearl plaque, air entrapment. That sounds good. State industrial was going to buy that, so the same doctor wrote a letter said, No, I don't think so. I think it's emphysema. I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. But at the same time, our governor was in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida walking through the back of fields. All we've done is we've been fighting political battles since day one. And I've written letters, written letters to Hazel Leary. Uh, in fact, I got a letter here that I want to read to you, just uh, one sentence. It's from the Government Accountability Project. This is Washington, D.C. So thank you for your contact with the Government Accountability Project. Your story is that installs outrageous in all of us. Regretfully, Government Accountability has an extreme full dock at the present time. Accountability, you know where. If there's anybody out there ever worked in the Lucky Pots, I'd love to talk to them. In fact, when I worked in Tea Plant, I don't know one soul that's alive today that worked in Tea Plant on my particular shift. 
and I thank you all for listening to me. Thank you, sir. Owners of Pipe Fitters Union, Local 598. And uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for coming out here. And uh, I'd like to dedicate uh, the rest of my remarks uh, to the memory of my father, who worked as a pipe fitter in the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and early 90s at Hanford. <coughs> uh, he died last year of cancer. Uh, he uh, was diagnosed as having uh, asbestosis uh, and, and he extreme hearing loss. Like I said, I'd like to thank you for coming out today. Uh, it's too late to help my father, but it's not too late to help the members that are still living and are still working at Hanford. I represent around 16,000 construction workers. I represent the construction workers that work at Hanford. Uh, our members are employed both by the prime contractors and their subcontractors who come on site and uh, currently most of our members are employed by the subcontractors. We feel very strongly that the safety and health has been poorly integrated on the site and that the health of our members has been threatened and diminished as a result. Although much has been done to improve on this, uh, more needs to be done not only with the prime contractors, but there's no doubt subs that come on site that are still inadequately informed about the hazards they may face and that the site is not well enough equipped to monitor their performance. As you know, we have a program of medical screening for construction workers uh, who have worked on site. Of the 1,000 workers who have been interviewed to date, 98% say that they have been exposed to health hazards on the job. 86% think that their health has been damaged as a result of their work at the Hanford site. The medical exams being conducted confirm the workers' concerns. About one half have evidence of lung damage. Almost all of our members have serious hearing loss. And so far, 28 have tested positive for beryllium exposure. It seems clear from the data that the building trades workers have experienced many exposure, exposures as a result of not knowing the hazards they were working around. For instance, the rate of positive beryllium tests is much higher among the building trades workers than the production workers. This gives us concern about the workers now engaged in construction, maintenance, repair, demolition, and cleanup activities. We do not know what types of hazards they come in contact with and are they protected adequately. Let me give you one example. Last year, an evaluation of buildings with possible beryllium dust was completed. However, these inspections did not include the rafters of the areas above, and, uh, areas above the ceiling tiles. That's where a lot of maintenance and repair work is done on pipes, uh, electrical lines, uh, uh, heating HVAC systems. My guess that is, is that if you expect to find beryllium dust at Hanford now, those are the areas that you'll need to uh, examine. I think it's clear that we have problems that we will uh, have to address in the future. I would like to suggest the following recommendations for you to consider. One. Workers employed by some subcontractors should be given parity with the Federal Department of Energy employees and employees of prime contractors in terms of safety and health, protections and compensations for injuries and illnesses arising out of the work at DOE facilities. Two, we need to examine the medical screening program for former workers. It has a budget of $790,000 per year. We believe we could use $1.6 million per year. It is also, <clears throat> it will need to be extended. Uh, currently, uh, we're looking at somewhere around 27,000 workers who, who need to be tested. And, and yet our budget only allows to have 1,000 examinations per year. Uh, third, we hope that the uh, site staff will make use of the data that's being collected in screening programs as they think about ways to improve safety and health programs and plans on the site. 
We think we can learn much from our past uh, failures on the site. I want to thank you for what you're doing to improve compensation programs. We'd like your support as we begin to seek a simplified system of workers' comp filing, particularly for the large number of people who have found in the screening program to be in need of ongoing annual medical surveillance. This site is self-insured for workers' comp, and as the first of this year, we're self-administered. DOE can clearly do whatever the, it wants to as long as it meets Washington state law. We have been surprised that the site needed to import a third party's workers' comp administrator from Texas to run the program. Because it's our understanding that workers' comp in Texas is much less worker-friendly than in Washington. The first change was made instead of the workers' uh, doctors filing an initial claim directly with the comp administrator, as was the case in the past. Now they have to file it with the uh, uh, contractors, the employers. Although the site says this will improve the claims filing process, we are skeptical, extremely skeptical. We think that the government is banding together with the contractors to gang up, gang up on the injured workers. We hope that you can stop that. In addition, we would like to, uh, to see civilian workers of Department of Energy sites treated as Cold War veterans and that they become eligible for VA benefits. Many of the workers we see in the medical screening program are retired. Many of them do not have adequate health coverage, as you heard tonight. Many of them retire early because construction work is hard physical toil. And to keep at it until you're 65, uh, would, would require extraordinary health. Having VA benefits would take care of this problem. Our members who have worked here are genuinely proud of the service that they provided to our nation, and they are deserving of gaining VA benefits and VA status. I have a number of specific suggestions to incorporate in the proposed Energy Employees Beryllium Compensation Act. One is it should extend to cover all occupational illnesses, including asbestosis-related diseases. That, that special provisions found in Titles 2 and 3 should be extended to all DOE facilities and within those facilities to all contractors and subcontractors, subcontractor workers. The lump, the lump sum benefit of $100,000 should be enlarged. It is not sufficient today in today's economy in light of the whole harmless provision that it incorporates. You should compensate both for past damage and for giving up of future rights and any additional claims. I think the amount closer would be somewhere in the $500,000 range. Workers who choose lump sum settlement amount should be given additional medical coverage for life. For radiation related illnesses, we urge that you incorporate the much enlarged list of conditions approved by the VA in August of 99. And we also think that you should drop all conditions concerning other possible exposures. We believe you should use qualitative terms like evidence of significant exposure to radiation rather than specific dose as defined risk. Uh, finally, in the, in the 57 years since the Manhattan Project began, processing radioactive materials to produce bombs, the government has until now minimized the hazards of radiation and chemicals, criticized epidemiological studies that raise related questions to spent and spent tens of millions of dollars defending itself against lawsuits that were charging that these plants have made workers sick. I urge you to promote the pending bill that will amend the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act to be enlarged to include workers who have, who have been employed at Hanford, and that you incorporate into it the changes that I suggested earlier. I think you understand that we have given these matters much thought and that they are a great concern to our members. I hope we can be, uh, I hope we can work together in the future to bring your initiatives to fruition. Thank you. Mr. Pinkle here, Jim no, Pinkle. He's gone. He's gone. Uh, can I just say, I know it, it's getting late, we'd like to hear from everybody. If you feel you can't stay, um, we do have an 800 number. Uh,
call us or, or grab one of my staff people before you leave, and we will make sure to get your story. So. We have at least right, twice as many people to go as we have already spoken. Is Mr. Maffeo still here? Yes. And Mr. Maffeo, you're up. Uh, Mr. Matthew Taylor to follow. And again, uh, okay, Taylor. Try and keep in mind that uh, we've got quite a few folks to go through, and uh, if we can be as uh, concise as possible, we're going to benefit us all. Good evening. <coughs> Mr. Michael, Dr. Michaels, and Jim Hall. Well, I'm going to be very brief. I have, I didn't write anything down except a couple of notes here. But primarily, my question is about my brother-in-law. He worked at Hanford in the K East and K West reactors, and he died a terrible death, cancer, <coughs> which is not mentioned very much here, but. I know a lot of people there, and I've been, I've been in the Tri-City area since 1949 and worked in the, in the 200 East and 200 West area and uh, in the analytical laboratory. So we came in contact with all of the ingredients. We analyzed everything that the processing did. But anyway, before I continue, I want to go back to my brother-in-law. And is there anything... Now he's dead. And is there any compensation for it, for him available? And how do we go about uh, trying to find out? Well, in some ways, that's the question we're here tonight to try to begin to think about. If he, for beryllium disease, just as uh, you know, an example, the comp if the legislation passes, there would be like, there would be compensation for people who died 10 or 15 or even 30 or 40 years ago from beryllium disease. If that approach is taken for radiation-related cancer, and if your brother-in-law's cancer was radiation-related, there would be compensation for him. But that's a lot of ifs, I know. Well, uh, you see, we're, we're narrowing the gauge here. We're just closing the gauge, and beryllium is the main thing. Uh, I filled out something about beryllium, but I never got an answer back. Nobody answered me. I don't know what happened. Call, no, don't call us. You got to call this. You got to call that. I call everybody. Send in the papers. Never heard of it. But looking at the broader picture, I mean, I want to. I, I like to see everybody encompassed in this thing. For instance, is there a number that my sister can call about this? Is there an 800 number? That there is. Um, the number. Of, uh, don't have the sheet in front of me. Oh, well, there's an 800 number here, but this number has, uh, uh, my friend just told me that this 1-877-447-9756 does not work. How many else have that problem with this number? Anybody here? Here's, here's the general. There's another one there. Well, we do have quite a few calls coming in. Um, I think is there another number that they can call? No, that's the number to call. But the problem is we're not going to be able to have an answer for you on compensation for your brother-in-law because there has to, there has to be legislation passed. Um, <laughs> and that's really what we're here to gather information to, to begin to do. Computer. Recording. Just have John pass that bill. But I think... You know, I, I think the story of your brother may be helpful in helping pass that. Um, theoretically, you have coverage, and he has coverage under Washington State LNI, but I think there are some limitations to that. I think everybody knows that. And that's why uh, Secretary Richardson is committed to trying to get legislation beyond just brilliant disease, but to look at all the all workers across well, the state. this is cancer. I mean, no, there's nothing, nothing right in, in, in the program now to cover this. And right. There's nothing my sister can call or can call anybody. That's right. And that, this. I, I wish I could give you a different answer. There's nothing to do yet. No. Um, if we get legislation, then, then we'll how, how, if, if, if it happens, how would my sister know if she lives in Oregon? Well, I think well, if this legislation passes, we'll certainly do an outreach program. Can I get around. one of these little cards again? <laughs> you want to get one of these and know that? Well, something has happened? Well, I don't know. I hope we can do at least that well. Maybe a lot better. But um, I, I can't answer that yet. Well, in addition, we covered uh, this 
a lot of things that uh, these people covered here. But uh, I look at a broader picture here, Dr. Michaels. For instance, back injuries on the job. Has anybody ever heard of a pig? A hundred pound pig? Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Well, lifting those hundred pound pigs, do you know what that is? That's a container. It's about this big and about that, that amount. Solid lead hooks up for a little tiny hole in the middle, which you put in a, a sample. And I remember myself lifting those this high, high level. And when the first time I tried to pick it up, it almost fell over. <laughs> I didn't think it was that heavy. But anyway, uh, and, that, and that, that is a concern for, you know, repeated uh, heavy lifting like that is, is additive to the back. And later on in life, you get to say, I wonder what I did, you know? But anyway. Is there anything for that? Probably not. Heart disease, congestive heart failure, cancer, diabetes, and other diseases caused by chemical ingestion or radiation and or radiation exposure. These are all the, uh, the things that uh, I would like to see in Compass. And I don't have a sign that says, here we accomplish the impossible immediately. Now, if you want a miracle, it takes two minutes longer. Two seconds longer. We don't have that. The cold, the hot war was over, and the cold war ensued. And there was a lot of pride out here. A lot of pride. We talk about safety. Yes, there was a lot of safety. In all the other procedures that we had, we had the procedure on the left hand side, and safety on the other, step by step. If it had 20 steps, there would be 20 comments. Beware of this, be careful of that, don't do this, don't do that. So there was a very, very, and yet there was problems. You know, there was something popped up that would be, that would be wrong. And it was rectified. And, and there was a lot of pride in the people here. We, we really, and I, I really uh, thought that it was a magnificent uh, effort. I mean, solid, and it wasn't just an individual effort, it was everybody that participated in this, in this tremendous effort, because production, production, production was a key, and safety, safety, safety ran right alongside of it. But do thank you for coming here, and uh, and maybe there'll be something looked at even in these, these areas here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown, Mr. Taylor, standing by ready. If it's free. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing. This is, this is probably linked, but indirectly. Use my gift. Oh. Uh, this is probably, it, it's not directly linked to this, but it's the, uh, something that I'm, I'm, I'm engaged in, and that is the Memorial Fund. I'll be a field representative for the Memorial Fund of World War II veterans. And, uh, and somebody in DOE is all, I also talked to several people already, and there will be an announcement made in the press, press release or something, as soon as I get the documents from the DC. So, beware, you may be called <laughs> for the World War II Memorial. We have an Thank you. Mr. Taylor's up. Judith Morales will be next. Jim Pinkle, I think he signed up twice. I think we found him. He's not here. Mr. Tim. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Matt Taylor. Uh, I'm a whistleblower here on the Hanford site. Uh, I'm here tonight to speak uh, on behalf of the current Hanford workers. I, I really feel for a lot of you past workers and the ones that are currently working in Hanford and are ill. Uh, I really hate to think about in the future the kind of health effects that I'm going to be facing. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Michaels for being here and uh, Secretary Richardson for listening uh, to the comments that are made here tonight. Uh, what I would like to ask for on behalf of the current Hanford workers and the people that are out there, Dr. Michaels stated that uh, Secretary Richardson is dedicated to preventing any more sick workers at Hanford. 
And with the current situation that we have here on the Hanford side, I've been I've been made to choose between my health and safety and my career. Uh, right now, I'm an unemployed Hanford worker uh, because I've been listed as a whistleblower. I've spoken with Mr. Klein. Uh, I've spoken with many uh, people from the DOE employee concerns here. Right now, on the Hanford side, there there are still people that are being exposed. Uh, I've been in the 300 area, digging up the old drums. Uh, the contractors not telling people what the contents of the drums were. Uh, things like carbon tetrachloride, TCEs, PCBs. Uh, I only found out that they existed through a FOIA request. Uh, DOE seems to be very impudent in policing themselves on the Hanford side. OSHA and NIOSH have made certain standards out there for exposure for both radiation and for chemicals. And I'm here to ask that you step aside and let OSHA back out on the site or let OSHA police the sites and the levels that are set for worker protection because right now the DOE RL people just are not policing the sites. When a contractor is found to be guilty of something, there's no fines levy. Uh, I'm here to, to request on behalf of the Hanford workers that are currently working out there some kind of protection for those that are willing to stand up for their rights uh, and, and for their health and safety. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I go to that speaker, let me say to the, if there are people still in the overflow room, there are plenty of seats now in the main auditorium. I would like to welcome you, and there are 550 people who came here tonight. Um, obviously, some have gone home after that early morning for um, tomorrow morning's shifts. But we appreciate all of you who are staying until the, the end. I hope it's not the bitter end. Um, just to let you know, we have over 50 people who have applied to speak. Um, we've gone through about 25 of them, and obviously some have left. But we're going to keep going through them. So. Um, please be concise um, when you speak. It's Judith Morales here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Brown, with Edson Brown, will be next. Maybe that's correct. Go ahead, Ms. Hi, Dr. Marcos. Um, I look around and I see a lot of colleagues, um, present and former, and it's discomforting to see that when I was the new kid on the block a few years back, um, these people were healthy and vibrant. And I see them today and think, wow, is that going to be me in another 10 or 15 years? And what my concern is, I was involved in an incident um, July 17th, 97, at 222 S Laboratory. Oh, but let me back up first. I like to say that I'm in safety because people don't bother to ask questions. But when you tell them that you're the rad cop, you know, they get a little bit excited and, you know. Anyways, um, I have worked in the 200 areas, uh, which is, encompasses U03, which you've heard horror stories about, the tank farms, tea plant. I've worked at 234-5, uh, known as PFP, um, and many other names as well. I spent a little bit over 11 years at 222S Laboratories, and presently now um, I just work out in the environment all over the site collecting radioactive tumbleweeds. Because I can no longer presently work in a facility because I have been diagnosed with chemical sensitivity or environmental illness is another name for it. And I have um, documentation, and what it is, it's been a, a slow and an ongoing um, process where the facility, they There'll be an incident, four hours later, they'll go in and they'll do a monitor in a room where somebody has been exposed to some form of chemical or they'll maybe make it in there another 12 or 24 hours before you know they actually get a, uh, a good reading with some of the type of equipment that they use, whether it be a charcoal car cartridge or whatever the case may be. But to make a long story short, um, it's still ongoing. There's been numerous incidences at the labs for a number of years. You've heard a lot of people refer to the analytical laboratory. Um, the ventilation, they have updated it over the years, but for the last two years now, they have been going to clean up the deck level, but, pardon me, not the deck level, the ducts. 
And I believe at this time, it presently has not been cleaned out. It's just ongoing promises. HHF, though, when you go in, oh, well, that's just Judy. Well, we'll just, you know, check her oxygen, check her blood pressure, check her vitals, see if she's good and back to work. Be because of uh, the sensitivities, we have a handle on it. Some of the people, they're more thorough, but it, it gets very frustrating because depending on who you are and what, and what the um, incident is, is, is how you're treated. Um, for the most part, most of the medical staff is very professional, but there have been times it's very frustrating. Um, I just want to say that I have had uh, problems dealing with the state with my benefits. I have been compensated, but now they want to close my case because they feel, oh, well, that was a one-time acute incident, and, you know, oh, chemical sensitivity, they just kind of blow you off, but I'm going to continue pursue it, and there's not too many of those cases around. Uh, a lot of them are asbestosis, uh, radiation, and such. But there are other people that are out there that don't want to come forward because they don't want to be known as a troublemaker or labeled as a whistleblower. Um, I just, you know, I hope you guys truly look at each and individual, every case, and um, take, take it for what it's worth. It's just, it's very frustrating, and I know it will be a long time coming before anything is, is complete, but you, know, you, you look around, and like I said, I, I look at all these colleagues of mine. You know, when I was the new kid on the block and all their medical problems, it's, it's frightening, because I'm still fairly young, and I have two young boys, 10 and 11, and I want to see them graduate. I want to have grandchildren. Thank you. I believe it's Elsie Brown. Is Elsie Brown here? Gay, Gay Oglesby? I hope I'm saying that person right. All right. You're up now, I believe. Paul Kramer will be next. Paul Kramer. Thank you again for coming and being so tolerant of all of this because I know that you're not feeling well today. I have to say that I thought the health standards I was working on and under at Hanford was protecting my health and that of others. This fact is very clearly identified in my records. The current standards are not protective enough. I have learned the hard way that there is no safe threshold level. As a former site and facility of water coordinator, what is Mr. Salinas doing working in a radiation dome, di dome diagnosis leukemia? Can Mr. Klein call him to discuss the matter and relocation to a non-radiation zone? Um, I began work at Bee Plant June 1st, 1987. I dared to express my concerns uh, while I worked at Bee Plant by by finally in 1989 stating, I will not be exposed to radiation chemicals as an unprotected employee anymore. My manager was dying of terminal cancer. I was becoming very ill. The Cold War is escalated and the battle goes on. Every congressperson who spoke tonight, represented here, has been thoroughly orientated regarding employee health concerns presented by many who are in this room. Typically, Doc Casey's is content to state he nor his aging parents have ever experienced any adverse health effects caused by Hanford. The cancer and many other related ailments my family experienced is difficult to observe, especially their deaths. And too many matters to make matters worse. Potential human experience implementation on my children is still denied. The school records are destroyed. Some information is made available which seems quite incriminating. And if an exposure evaluation is recorded by my inter international team of expert witnesses, the cost is $24,000. My expert witnesses are led by a PhD epidemiologist who peer reviews peers. Who could afford this? Not, no, not very many people could afford that over and over again. 
I am involved in two litigations. The government agency, ETL, has spent $96 million plus of taxpayer funding on their litigation costs. The residing senior judge, Alan A. McDonald, was originally exposed as finding nothing better to do with his time than over a decade, decade, decade but passing disparaging personal notes to his clerks. Uh, the results and review exposed the content of certain notes which reflect horrifying slurs against minorities, women, and certain plaintiffs who he feels is psychiatrically incompetent. And the battle goes on there. Um, just because plaintiffs filed their injury suit against the USD and contractors. Many of the plaintiffs are offsprings of former deceased downwinders. The offsprings are also former existing, existing offsprings. One of my daughters is, is, partic is uh, participating in a beryllium monitoring program already after being exposed to beryllium that the DOE informed her of 12 years after it happened. She's very, she gets very ill at times. My son-in-law is also enrolled in the Gulf War Syndrome monitoring program. His health is deteriorating. My grandson or granddaughter would have been born two years ago but died of genetic mutations. My eldest daughter is recovering from another bout of chronic bronchitis and pneumonia and she got very ill uh, before Christmas. I am diagnosed with 76 ailments several of which are prognosed as terminal. My physicians state on record that they do not know what to do for me except cut a cancer away when it, when it develops, which they have done. I refuse to take all the medication prescribed. I use alternative ways and means to alleviate the problems and the pain encountered. My bee plant boss died of cancer after I had been exposed to many toxins, including radiation and chemicals. The walls in my office were always wet from leaks coming from the roof, which is highly contaminated, or from the aqueous makeup area above my office. I was exposed to asbestos, and I'm told I was exposed to beryllium. I was relocated to town to perform my bee plant job after suffering, suffering six reactions because of my heart condition in one day. I was moved to the, B, uh, to the federal building where I did my bee plant job, which caused more stress because I wasn't there. Uh, retaliation continued until Hazel Leary came to my rescue in April, on April 17, 1996, by enforcing her initiatives after her subordinate and policy fired me. I was fired by DOE personnel, which she had to retract. John Wagner and Mary Houston provided false information to the workers' comp folks, which is on record and the Office of Employee Protection, which caused my workers' comp to be denied uh, involving the radiation chemical exposures. The asbestos exposure is still open. Um, I was exposed to radi radiation chemicals, which was admitted on record um, by the managers, and the residing USD order, uh, ordered, the residing USD judge ordered the record destroyed, so I would never know, and that's on record. A DOE witness designated under oath, my deceased manager often wiped up the radiation counts with a towel and disposed of it without anybody knowing, um, except for the people that were watching him. Proposal. DOE regulations are in place to end the nightmare for thousands of people that have been in this room, some of which have been in this room tonight. Um, and Hazelwood O'Leary began her enforcement after only five days, and I was better. And I suggest that all these people that des are deserving uh, get a chance to resolve their issues in five days or begin anew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is Mr. Kramer, Paul Kramer? Yes. H.P. Smith is next. Good evening. I'm reading a statement on behalf of 11 workers and former workers from the Hanford Nuclear Facility. Each of us, myself included, was injured from the explosion at the plutonium finishing plant Hanford on May 14, 1997. It is very difficult for us to attend this meeting and hear these statements of concern about worker safety at nuclear plants when we are still waiting for the government to fulfill its promises made to us and to our families over two and a half years ago. 
On the night of May 14, 1997, we 11 workers were present at the plutonium finishing plant in Wickham for this. Laborers, operators, health technicians, electricians, and supervisors. At around 8 p.m., an explosion lived in the roof of the plutonium reclamation facility. The explosion occurred in the building and in one of the rooms to make finished radioactive plutonium. At that time, one of our number was standing at the door of the building about to enter it and was blown backwards by the explosion. Another was operating the ventilation system of the building. Eight of us were directly outside the building. Another arrived soon after. While the plume of orange and yellow gas came funneling out of the building, eight of us were directed to walk through that plume to other locations on site, not once, but twice, for some people, three and four times. That very night, we suffered skin lesions and blisters. Over the following days, we suffered intense, prolonged headaches, severe body aches, which forced us to bed, loss of lung function, permanent hearing loss, and other symptoms which lasted weeks and months, and many of which continue to this day. Some of us have lost all feeling in our fingers and arms. Neurologists have told us that this is the result of chemical exposure that night at the plutonium finishing plant in Hanford. The event has been devastating to ourselves and families. In addition to our physical problems, five of us have been diagnosed with severe emotional problems stemming from that night in the aftermath. Despite promises from then-Secretary of Energy, Federico Pena, we were denied an independent medical evaluation for months after the explosion until it was too late to perform any tests. The night of the explosion, we drove ourselves to the hospital. At the hospital, our requests for blood and urine tests to learn what we might have been exposed to were refused. During the month after the explosion, we were lied to about the results of early evaluation for plutonium exposure. Even when we were later given some health screening, it was deliberately limited in scope and was too late to be very effective. The night of the explosion, we were sent home in our work clothes, ensuring exposure of our families. Despite promises by Secretary Pena that our families would also be evaluated, not one member of our families have received evaluation for all possible toxic exposures. It's very difficult to believe statements made tonight about concern for worker safety while we still suffer from these events which occurred over two years ago. If we are to believe the promises made tonight, the government should start by keeping its promise many years ago and address the health problems this event has caused in our lives and in the lives of other workers like us. Thank you for your concern. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Is Mr. Schmidt here? H.P. Smith? He's got him. Got him. Okay. Terry Clute. Is that right? K-L-U-T-E. Okay. Next will be, I believe it's Lester Bolton. Thank you, Dr. Michaels, for coming out. Uh, we appreciate it. We don't get, get a chance to uh, get the other end out here very often because we're a long way from D.C., even though we're the real Washington. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be brief. I'm a nuclear chemical operator out there, out of Hanford here, and I've been, uh, I've been out here for 32 years. Uh, my parents were working here before me. And uh, my concern, besides the people that are here tonight, you've heard all those stories, and those are all true, and uh, they need help. But the people that are still here are, are very concerned about some of the things that are currently going on. And although this doesn't have anything to do with the legislation, in a roundabout way it does. We're the Cold War vets. We did, a, did the job when it needed to be done, and uh, we helped out the nation, and should be treated as veterans. Uh, these compensation laws should be enacted for everyone, not just for certain places. The concern that I have the, about the current uh, going on here is the physicals that are being eliminated. Normally we'll get a physical every year, and uh, those have been very helpful. Most people would agree that 
that a lot of conditions have been discovered while uh, as a result of these physicals, and uh, we'd like to see that continue, but, uh, of course. There is a current effort to eliminate the frequency of those physicals based on the plant that you're currently working in. A uh, study has been done based only on where you're currently working and uh, the decision then to continue your physicals or to back them off to every two years or every three years or every five years would be based solely on that. No consideration was given to previous exposures. And like I said, I've uh, been there for 32 years. I've been all over the project. Uh, the plant I'm currently in, I'm in because my seniority gives me the ability to find a good place to go when I'm a little older and would like to not be in the radiation and be in the, uh, the effects of uh, some of the other projects. Uh, being a union person, I can do that. I can, I can pick where I want to be. So I, I moved to a, a quieter place. The quiet place then put me in a different category. So now they don't want to uh, give me physicals as often as they, they did before. Just in uh, my life, uh, there's a point in my life after 32 years of service out there, one who probably should be looking more, not less. Uh, that, that, uh, that condition really concerns me and my, my co-workers. We don't think it's fair. We think uh, that that needs to be looked at. The health effects won't be discovered if nobody's looking. The uh, hampers need to be included in any new laws and, and any, any health care comp. Uh, there, there's been bills out there before for nuclear workers, compensation for nuclear workers, and it should be all inclusive. It shouldn't just, just be a couple of plants back east. They have problems. They're just as uh, in need as we are, but, but everybody needs help. Uh, Idaho Falls, us, uh, Rocky Flats, all those places. We should be treated more like civil service workers because that's essentially what we are. There should be some sort of a program where a, a person can retire after, say, 30 years, regardless of age, just to get them away from these exposures. They did their time, they did their job. I'm not complaining, the pay was good, uh, but let's do the right thing and take care of these folks. Asbestos and beryllium are real problems, but they're not our only problems. Thank you very much. Is Lester Bolton here? Lester Bolton? Yeah, I'll pass on that. I think it's pretty well covered on it. Anything I want to say. The crowd thanks you, sir. <laughs> Jim Young. Is Jim Young here? Karen Salvador. <coughs> Jim Young, Karen Solomon is now, and Lynn Taylor will be next. Worked in. That's how I met him. 
Um, I can't speak to whether my exposures caused my thyroid cancer as a downwinder or whether it was as an employee, but I can say that I am the only person in my family who worked at Hanford ever. And I'm the only person in my family that's ever had a thyroid cancer or any cancer of any kind. I have had a total thyroidectomy and I have to suffer through uh, other physical ailments as a result of complications from that surgery. And I have to take a little pill every day and I'll have to wear this Hanford necklace, they call it, every day. But uh, nonetheless, I, I just wanted to come today to share my thanks in the Department of Energy coming forward and admitting that there may have been exposures to Hanford workers. I'm very proud of the administration for, for making this uh, very brave move. And uh, as part of my commitment to this whole effort, um, I have been an advisory board member for the Hanford Health Information Network in, uh, for the state of Washington, uh, which is a voluntary position for about the last five or six years. And part of the reason I became an advisory board member is because I do believe and I do hear and represent the public um, as far as their health concerns as downward winners. And that also includes Hanford workers as well. We have, we have made information available. And as you know, I heard you mention earlier that uh, when the lady came up and stated that um, she wanted to know where she could get information about health, radiological health effects, and you had mentioned to her that the CDC and ATSDR had programs that were available. One of those programs is AHHIN, as you know. And uh, as you probably know, we were supposed to be funded through year 2001, and we've run into some funding crisis, and I'm sure you're very familiar with that. I'm hoping that in light of this new information that's been shared, and this um, willingness that the Department of Energy has shown to deal with these issues, uh, again, I can't say thanks enough because this is validation for so many people and such good work that you're doing and so very healing and I want to thank you for that. Um, that I, I just want to implore to you how I personally feel I wish they would find a way to continue the education through the HHIN and fund it through year 2000, especially in light of this new, new information and this new uh, where we're at today. And um, bottom line, um, this is really nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to be able to handle this a lot better than I am. But nonetheless, I just want to say thanks again for allowing us to come and speak our minds. And please, if in any way possible you have any influence over that funding that's supposed to go through routed through CDC, thanks to the DOE for contributing to the operation of the HHIN for the last five or six years, it has not all been a waste, I assure you. It has, we, the, the education that is done for physicians through this program and the education of the public and Hanford workers has been appreciated by myself and many others, and um, I just want to say thanks for the past support, and please, if possible, see if we can't continue it, at least in light of this new era we're in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.